tonight on A Turning Point. Three words that have caused an uproar in education across the country. So what is critical race theory and why does it cause such division? In their own words, kids are being taught to be colorblind and how it impacts them. And the recreation of a famous experiment that impacted another conversation on race and education. What the doll experiment teaches us about our perspectives on race. Plus, how critical race theory could change the conversation moving forward for everyone. Those stories and more tonight on a special edition of Front Row, a turning point. Next. Good evening, everyone. Welcome in. This is Front Row at Turning Point. I'm Jim Donovan. And I'm Lena Lyme. It is a concept that's been making headlines over the past several months and maybe is something you might not understand. So tonight we're tackling critical race theory, where it came from, what it means, and the impact it's having in and out of the classroom. First, we're going to kick things off with a little background on critical race theory, kind of a refresher course of sorts. Here's Sarah Shookman. Three words that have caused the biggest uproar in education in recent memory. Critical race theory. It's a concept that has passionate supporters and critics and plenty of people confused. So what is it really and why is it such a hot topic? Let's start with a definition. Critical race theory is a term first coined by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. It's an evolving study critiquing how the social construct of race and institutionalized racism perpetuate a racial caste system that relegates people of color to the bottom tiers. Dr. Max Crotchmull, an ethnic studies professor at Texas Christian University, explains it's not new. The concept was largely taught in higher education, first developed by academics in the 70s and 80s. And they said, great, the civil rights movement has come and gone. There have been all these changes, all these new civil rights laws, and yet racial inequality persists. Why is that? Janelle George is an associate professor of law at Georgetown University. She teaches a course on the presence and impact of racial inequality in K through 12 public education. She says she teaches that class using critical race theory as a lens. Critical race theory is a verb, it's not a noun. It's an approach for understanding and examining race and racial inequality and how it can be replicated through systems and structures. Recently, the conversation has morphed from the world of education to the world of politics. Ignited last September after then-President Donald Trump condemned the 1619 Project, a Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times report which frames American history around the year 1619, when the first enslaved people were brought to the colonies. The former president calls it propaganda, and many of his supporters are concerned it's being taught to K-12 through students, arguing it creates a divisive environment that paints white people as oppressors. In this turning point time for racial inequality and racial justice, those who support critical race theory say it puts an important emphasis on outcomes, not individual beliefs, and calls on these outcomes to be examined and changed, resulting in very different takes on those three words and their place in our history and our future. Two people having a debate have to agree on the basic terms of what it is they're debating. That's not what's happening right now. Sarah Shookman, 3 News. And now the Republican-led Ohio legislature is looking to pass laws that would block schools from teaching what they call the promotion of divisive concepts involving race. Tonight, a look at the bills and the fierce opposition from teachers. Too often teachers are telling students what to think not teaching them how to think. Two Ohio bills introduced this summer seek to control how issues of race are taught in the classroom. Teaching our children that they're either victims or victimizers does not inspire change or love. House Bill 322 would outlaw teaching that fault, blame, or bias should be assigned to a race or sex. And the advent of slavery constituted the true founding of the United States. This in apparent reference to the New York Times Magazine 1619 project. And where they were headed, black equals slave. 
A second Ohio House bill, 327, introduced by Republican Diane Grendel from Geauga County. It goes beyond the classroom to outlaw in local and state government teaching, advocating, or promoting divisive concepts. This bill does not prevent schools or government entities from teaching about racism, slavery, and segregation. What it does do is prohibit schools from indoctrinating students by claiming one race is superior to another. But already, opponents have zeroed in on the bill's broad language. Please define promote. And I don't think that the bill specifically defines promote, so it may be something that we need to revisit with Representative Grendel. Three News reached out multiple times for an interview with Grendel, but she ignored our request. My ancestral history was rewritten to make it palatable to the masses. Both bills have ignited a fury in the state's largest teachers' unions. Critics accuse politicians of using the issue as a dog whistle to rally their base. We enter very dangerous territory when government starts to tell us we can't talk about controversial or so-called divisive topics. Ohio is among at least 22 states that have passed or are considering laws that set limits on how teachers can frame American history. A controversial effort that could itself go down in history. Lena Lai, 3 News. And Governor Mike DeWine's press secretary, Dan Tierney, issued a statement to 3 News on critical race theory, saying, quote, the governor opposes critical race theory because it divides rather than unites Americans. He further adds, we should never shy away from teaching the good and bad of American history, but we should help our children appreciate what unites us rather than what divides us. It was an experiment that changed the course of U.S. history, helping to desegregate schools. And all it took were some kids and some baby dolls. Now, more than 60 years later, would the results be any different? Will you has that story. I don't really know what about it stuck with me. Texas A&M assistant professor Dr. Kid. Tony Sturdivant <laughs> first heard about Dr. Kenneth and Mamie Clark's doll experiments as an undergrad and has been thinking about it ever since. I remember wondering if things were different, what would happen? The study questioned over 200 African-American children from three to seven years old about black and white baby dolls. They saying things like, give me the doll that you would like to play with, or give me the doll that looks bad. What they found was startling. Two thirds of the children selected the white dolls for positive attributes and the black dolls for negative attributes. The study showed that children as early as three are able to pick up on societal messages. And Dr. Kenneth Clark used that research as an expert witness in Brown versus Board of Education, demonstrating that separate but equal really wasn't equal when it generates a feeling of inferiority. Some of the children actually like were visibly upset with having to say that the black doll looked like them. Now, more than six decades after that experiment, Dr. Sturdivant decided to see if anything has changed. I didn't just include a white and black doll, I also included um, the Latina doll. She observed a multiracial Texas school for a semester, 13 students, four dolls, and salon props. Instead of asking children, like, which one is the bad doll or whatever, I just placed the dolls in their classroom. She took notes and followed up with some clarifying questions. And what she found... Uh, like, black dolls were stepped on, black dolls were cooked in the pots. Was pretty much the same startling thing the Clarks found all those years ago. The children still had this pro-white bias that the Clarks found earlier in their studies. So the black dolls had like Afro curly hair. So they would say, I don't want to play with that doll because it's curly. Dr. Sturdivant says although school desegregation was a good first step and may have helped, the work is far from done. And one of the ways to help kids and society move forward. It's okay to talk to their kids about race and feel good about their background. Is as simple and easy as talking. We do have data to support that adult silence about race um, fosters feelings of anti-blackness um, in not just black children, but all children, because us children are always learning, always. Will Uick, 3 News. Mm. The debate over critical race theory is definitely wide ranging. Our Leon Bibb gives us his perspective and he says to look forward, we must also take a look back at history. 
Maybe you've participated in a friendly game of tug of war, where you and your friends are pulling on one end of a rope and a group of people on the other end of the rope are pulling in their direction, a friendly competition. Well, that's a game, but there's a real tug of war going on in this country. And competition is history. How much of it should be told? At the center point is race, the subject which America has grappled since colonial times, before there was a United States. An old concept called critical race theory has been renewed in America's vocabulary. It deals with the question of addressing inequalities and racism in the United States. Specifically on the table is American history, with the question of how much of the horrible and painful parts should be told. Those in favor of critical race theory view the nation's past, even its ugliest parts, as part of the true historical document demanding to be told. Opposition believes what is past is past, and that today's people had nothing to do with yesteryear's pain. Case in point, the 1921 destruction of Greenwood, the black residential and highly successful business area in Tulsa, Oklahoma, destroyed by armed whites who hated the thriving community, referred to by blacks as Black Wall Street. The white rioters destroyed businesses and 1,200 homes as they murdered 300 people, secretly burying their bodies in unmarked graves, most of which have not yet been found. Then the story itself was killed, and the rioters tried to erase the crime from history, even forcing the fearful black survivors to remain silent until now. Acknowledging history causes us to find lessons learned which can provide guideposts for better futures. Some history is painful. Racial inequalities and racism of the past will stay with us if we do not study those times and learn lessons. Examination of the past, whether painful or good, helps us understand where to go next but for most of the nation's history, what was in the mass media omitted black life, giving America a whites-only perspective. Even in my school books in elementary school, we had very few images of black children and black people in the school. I learned of America, but only from one vantage point. It was as if I and people like me did not exist, even in the school books. In school, the people described and pictured in my books were always white. Television, in tens of millions of homes, was much the same. For racial minorities, it was as if we did not exist in the American culture, although we knew that we did. A better story now. Still, there is room for improvement. Each of us views life through our own individual experiences and understandings. Needed are various and diverse viewpoints giving us all better understandings of what others may feel. What is written of us can be a guide to a more truthful understanding of what was. And that can provide an inspiration for all of us to be all that we can be. For 3 News, I'm Leon Bibb. Up next, two teens talk about why you should not be colorblind and why it's an issue for kids today. The aftermath of George Floyd's 2020 murder has many people across the country engaging in or sometimes uncomfortably fumbling around discussions about race. Marissa Sines explores if colorblindness complicates those conversations in the classroom. Racism, ignorance, um, people who just, yeah, aren't educated. And Definitely white ignorance. It can be very harmful, especially to people who look like me. How many times have you heard someone say, I'm not a racist, I don't see color, or I'm colorblind? In a way, we like to think it's more simple if we just don't talk about racism, and so I think that goes right in hand with colorblindness. We're not all the same color, and that's okay because we all have different backgrounds. It's good to embrace um, the color of our skin and you know, just be, be okay with that. Andrew Easterling and Sophie Hull are students. One a senior in high school, the other a freshman in college. They tell me the issue of colorblindness can sometimes prevent cultural learning and understanding 
in the classroom. I think there is so much education that has been whitewashed. So I think colorblindness paints an incorrect version of history. Yeah. Yvonne Glass is a counselor who says kids at a very young age do see color. Children as young as six months can make the distinction of color in their caregiver. When we start talking about removing that in our teaching of children, a big part of that is children grow up and they don't, they're struggling with like, this is what the adults say, but this is my experience. And how do I reconcile that? And to build a foundation of acceptance, inclusion, and understanding, Glass says you have to start young. We want to make sure that at that K through 12 level that we're laying that solid foundation of looking beyond color. We want to pretend like we don't have different experiences by being of different ethnicities, but we do. It's a conversation young people say they're ready to have. Uh, we all just like want to be educated on each other's backgrounds, on, on race. We want to know what's the right and wrong thing to say. I definitely had moments where um, I might have canceled out the conversation of color because I'm scared of it. You don't have to be like, you know, nervous or afraid to, mm -hmm. to speak on racism. Um, in fact, like just you being conscious of that, I mean, mm -hmm. like it shows that I'm sure you don't have no any racist intent or mm -hmm. I'm sure you just want to become educated on it. So. Marissa Signs, 3 News. Still ahead on this special edition of Front Row, a turning point, a point counterpoint discussion on critical race theory. Representatives from both sides sit down with our own Russ Mitchell. That's next. Welcome back. Today's show is all about critical race theory and the impact of the current debate. Now we go to Russ Mitchell. He sat down with John Stover, Protecting Ohio Children, and Hassan Jeffries, Associate Professor of History at The Ohio State University. And here's part of their conversation. First of all, I want to thank you both for being with us today. Uh, quite an important subject. So my first question, I guess, would be uh, to you, Mr. Stover. What is your definition of critical race theory? Well, a definition of critical race, as far as I and our organization is concerned, Russ, has to do with what is we see being taught uh, primarily in the public schools now, and it's a very divisional term where you have um, those that are white being told that in many cases they should be considered the oppressor. They were born with white privilege. And uh, when you look at uh, those that are black or brown uh, colored, uh, they are considered to be the oppressed. Dr. Jeffries, let me ask you, what is your definition of critical race theory? Critical race theory is a, a framework that emanates out of law schools, uh, a way of seeing and understanding America's past and America's present. It is simply saying that you have to take race and racism seriously uh, as factors and forces in shaping the contours of the lives of all American people and consider the ways in which it intersects with other identities, with people's gender identity, with sex and the like. Mr. Stover, should, uh, do you think that kids should be told the perspective of the impact of race in America? I, I do disagree with uh, Dr. Jeffries on the fact that uh, it's not being taught. It is being taught. And uh, you even have had the uh, National Education Association head basically say, look, We'll defend any teacher that uh, decides that they're going to uh, teach it. We have, we have had, I believe it's five to six states in this country that have already passed legislation. In the state of Ohio, we have uh, House Bill 327 that uh, is currently in committee. And I'm sure it's gonna be discussed by the uh, General Assembly whenever they return here next month. We see that these bills that are in the General Assembly that are working their way uh, are, are, are bills uh, that are in search of a problem. Uh, we also understand that this furor, this hysteria around critical race theory is really a response uh, to the grassroots mobilization by millions of people in the summer of 2020 uh, as th who took to the streets uh, calling for justice not only for the victims of police violence, but also for an end to systemic racism, for the ways in which systems and structures in our society continue to perpetuate inequality on the basis of race. And so when the State Board of Education uh, passed uh, a resolution, a very strong resolution, that doesn't mention critical race theory, but says that we owe our students, uh, a, we have a responsibility to our students to tell them the truth about the past and to make sure 
that we are not continuing to perpetuate inequality. Where do you see common ground? I think you know, we may disagree uh, on what needs to be taught and how early, uh, but I would like to think uh, that we're all concerned about children. We're all concerned about uh, this country uh, and because we're leaving it to them. I mean, the children inherit uh, the future. They inherit this country. Uh, my concern uh, is that we're not preparing them adequately uh, to deal with the problems that we haven't solved ourselves unless we talk honestly, not late in the game, but even early in the game, uh, so that they are adequately prepared. I guess the, the, the real question, um, Russ and Dr. Jeffries, comes down to this, in my mind. Who ultimately has the right to see that their children are educated and what they are taught? And uh, if we believe that it's the, the state, which I do not, or the federal government, as far as the programs that they put in place, but I believe it's the parents. And I, I believe the parents, based upon their value that they have want to see ascribed into their children, they ultimately have that right. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank really you. Appreciate Thank it. you. We have much more coverage on the controversial topic of critical race theory, and that's available over on our website, WKYC.com. And right there, you can watch Russ Mitchell's full discussion on the topic, as well as an in-depth look at the topic that we have covered from start to finish here tonight. And that would be a worthy watch tonight, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, you know, I hope you learned something. You know, as, as parents, it's up to us to even maybe supplement our kids' education if you don't feel like it, that you're getting it from the schools. Absolutely. So check that out over at WKYC.com. Thank you for joining us tonight for this special edition of Front Row, a turning point. Betsy Kling, Will Uick, back tonight at 11. Have a great evening. <laughs>